Welcome. This is the uh, GNU C Library BOF. Um, we have 45 minutes set aside to talk about open topics the community wants to discuss. I've preceded some of these topics here uh, just to mention some of the things that have happened over the course of the last year. Obviously, we had glibc 234 come out just recently, August 1st. Um, there was significant work there involving 64-bit um, time T, um, uh, the work to merge a number of the libraries back into libcso.6, uh, that include libpthread into libcso.6, and a bunch of other features. We are currently developing the upcoming glibc 235 release, which will release uh, February 1st, 2022. Um, so, Development's open right now, and I wanted to give time for the community to talk about any open topics. Some of the open topics that I think are interesting is uh, perhaps asking if there's any feedback. Uh, we've been doing 10 months of patch queue review, which is to say every Monday there's uh, open discussion on IRC and via a uh, audio and video chat. Uh, framework in which we discuss the open queue of patches as they are in patchwork. Um, and I also want to say, you know, I'm very interested in how do we make it easier to gain consensus for basically accepting patches that have been reviewed and committing them. Um, and that's kind of where my my priorities end in terms of thinking about, you know, things we can talk about for the BOF. But let's turn it over to open topics. Um, does does anybody have any open topics we want to talk about for, for glibc right now? And I've got the chat open so I can uh, so I can look at that. Uh, Komathy, are you taking notes for us? Um, I can, but I... Uh, you you do not there. need to. Yeah, I heard I heard you earlier saying something and I wasn't sure if that was the... If you're I was just tra trying to get the no, uh, questions because Questions keep scrolling. Uh, I was moving the questions to the shared notes, which I'm, which I will do for the session as well. Sure, I'm going to watch the live chat and I'm going to take notes on the side, and then I will post any notes from the Glibc Boff right now to, uh, to Libc Alpha when we're when we're done the the Boff. In case anyone wants to raise any question, um, yeah, Michael, anything you want to ask? So let me, I know we had just had the the IBM boff and there's still IBM people in the room. Are we ready for the PPC 64 LE long double change and downstream? I think we had uh, the issues pointed out about uh, libg 4 trend that needs to be discussed. But otherwise, uh, things have been moving well on other upstream communities. So despite that, yeah, I think it looks okay. Okay, that that sounds good. Um, I'm trying to remember if there are any other power. I mean, there are some other power features, but I don't don't know if there's anything else that needs as much hand holding as the ABI transition. Yeah, I think that's pretty straight. Uh, Bill, anything you want to say? Yeah, if I have my mic down, you can hear me. Um, I was just pointing out that John had something in the chat about there being a lib standard C++ bug he still needs to look at uh, regarding the uh, long double change. Okay. So I'll make a note. Yeah, I see. Uh, so Jonathan says, open lib standard C++ bug. He's fixing. Yeah, it's just something. Yeah, but um, I'd say, Jonathan, that where, I mean, like, um, we have to make it, there's kind of this decision that happens as, as the whole GNU tool chain in, in that um, we prepare for the change and then downstream the distros have to decide that that's a transition that they want to take. I think in this case, um, the the areas where I work on would be in, in Fedora um, and looking at that transition as a system-wide change. But again, not necessarily a topic for glibc boff, but I was curious if all the glibc pieces were in place, and I think we largely are. And I've just taken notes on libg fortran and and uh, libstandard c++ being places. Um, I can talk a little bit about, yeah. Um, 
Uh, so I, I guess I want to garner some, I do want to garner some feedback. We've been doing um, weekly patch reviews and um, I'm, I'm curious for honest feedback from anybody in the community who's been attending those meetings. Um, have they been valuable? Can we structure them differently? Have they been working to ensure that senior reviewers, for example, have their eye on things that community members think are important? Um, I know, let me go down the list. I wonder if uh, Lukas is here for the 64-bit time tea patches. I think he attended several meetings to ensure, to kind of drive visibility for the patches he was working on. Um, yeah, uh, Florian, any feedback on that? I think uh, over the last month or two, it, it, the focus has shifted from general discussion uh, towards general discussion, and we don't really make much progress on on the patch list uh, as much as we used to. So, yeah, I mean, it. I think it's useful. I, it, it's also useful for like uh, feeling connected to the community, I suppose. But. Um, yeah, it's not really a patch queue review right now. Yeah, uh, more than general discussions, we we tend to do like a deep dive on specific issues, and those issues tend to be uh, owned by people who are on the call. So there's there's definitely that skew, and mm -hmm. uh, because of that, we we kind of tend to uh, focus on issues that like five or six people who 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 attended the call uh, have raised and and the patch list kind of uh, doesn't get as much visibility as it should can <coughs> yeah so as basically as like chair for the patch review um, i can give preference to effectively like walking the queue first and then asking people for any critical issues they want to raise and or refocusing that meeting so I'm taking notes, which is, I think it's valuable and we should refocus on the queue. Yeah. And probably find ways to uh, attract more people on the call. I don't, I don't know how uh, calls are not always the most favorite thing of, of most people. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, more calls or, or anything of that sort would, would actually solve that problem. Yeah, I don't think more call, more calls would solve the problem. It's one of those things like how do we focus review energy, potentially catching uh, people who'd submitted new patches and that those new patches need review. I find that for me, the weekly queue helps me, for example, pick things that I think uh, team members would be able to review and then gently guide people to say hey look these patches are something you could review it's it's within uh it's within a subsystem that you're you're familiar with and we need that thing to move forward and i catch i catch submissions from like new people submitting things that i say oh yeah that that's definitely someone from a, a drive-by contributor we want to make the experience for that drive-by contributor positive so let's pick that and put someone on it i i agree with you we lost a little bit of focus we probably need to refocus on on the queue for review and refocus making sure that we're reviewing the queue and if anybody wants to hand something out we hand it out um i had been tracking the queue data i didn't i didn't prepare a graph for it but it was interesting to see like when we focus on that queue that queue definitely goes down when we, when we defocus on the queue the queue goes back up again because i know when we focused on as we approached uh, the 234 release we got the patch queue down significantly under like 250 or something, and now it's it's back up because um, patches are slower to review. Uh, you know, we're I think we're a little defocused in the early development as we go, and we catch up on other tasks that we haven't done as we focused on the release. So yeah, so retrospective on 10 months, I feel like it's it's been a success, and that yeah, I'm I've made a note about refocusing on the queue for review. There's another question on the list, Carlos. Sure. Double check in that. So Lazy Parser has handed over this account to Mask Ray. Hello, Fang Ray Song. How are you doing? Uh, will glibc be happy with Clang buildability? The most important patch is to removal of C nested functions. This patch has been up for several weeks now. 
Um, so I can answer for myself. I think it is perfectly okay to be able to build with other glibc with other compilers. And in fact, I am strongly against nested C functions because I don't think they improve readability and it's difficult to use them and they have debug consequences. Um, so if we need to review a patch, then we need to review a patch. And I think that's basically probably a failure of the Monday patch review and that we need to refocus on the queue. Let me find that patch and see. And Joseph Meyer is asking about Bugzilla triage. And I'll get to, I'll get to that question in a, in a second. Uh, patchwork. Ellipses. So I looked at this patch actually. Yeah. And the trouble I see that I wasn't sure is if uh, it's possible to use static variables for the bootstrap allocation. Um, the nested functions, as far as I can tell, the nested functions in this context aren't just convenience, um, but are also required to avoid a relocation dependency for the bootstrap allocation. So you actually have to put the global state into a struct and pass it down by a pointer. Um, I could only test this on one uh, target that requires bootstrap allocation of the dynamic loader itself. And they had seemed to work, but I don't really know what that means in general or if the testing was good enough. Yeah, I think so, you... <laughs> The issues you're raising, Florian, are real issues, but hell if I know how to test that thoroughly. I, I know I looked at this code several years ago, and yes, nested functions were a requirement. Um, you might be able to get away with, with using inlines instead of nested, but gosh, this, this, this code is painfully hard. Um, and, and so I'd be very, I, I'd love to see us get away from it. The question is how to do so in a safe way. Uh, but I mean, like, we can restructure that code. There's so much data that get passed down in those functions that it probably should be a closure that has all the data yeah. in it that you need. And then it makes it way simpler to audit and way simpler to review. Joseph is making great comments here on the list, which is regarding claim buildability, each separate logical change should be sent separately. And so to answer um, Feng Ri's question, Absolutely, we would be happy with Clang buildability. Um, you know, where it makes uh, where it makes sense. I think we've had other discussions, for example, like the the, the LLD uh, Pi pick discussions, and largely what it comes down to is simply a technical discussion, making sure that the the technical choices we're making for the library and the project make sense uh, okay. when we're when we're targeting some of these features. It's it's probably yeah. a bad, it's probably a bad idea to avoid GNU, GNU extensions, uh, just because they are GNU extension. Uh, if the uh, if the if using the extension actually uh, improves performance, even if it's just one per mil or whatever, then it improves performance, and we should not throw it away because uh, some people want to build with uh, CLN. Correct. And so those are technical considerations. But for example, nested functions don't give great debug experience when you're debugging that code. Know, so there's a, know, there's a already a, there's already a maintenance impact for these things. So like already they cause problems. Now, the technical consideration, which is Florian says, is what do you do with the bootstrap relocations? In that yeah. case, I think it needs a rewrite to use a closure. And then when you rewrite with a closure, it the code gets even but, cleaner. But, it gets simpler. Yeah. But it already is written with the closure. That's what... Um... Uh, what nested functions are. Well, I think Carl's saying a more explicit closure build. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to kind of this, we, we're faking a closure with nested functions. That's what that's what we're doing. Sure, sure. And now you want to fake it explicitly. Okay. Well, we don't we don't fake it explicitly. I mean, like in glibc, there are con there are areas where we pass a closure, basically a structure to a function with its data. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a faked closure. Sure, if you want to call that a faked closure. Yeah. Same purpose. Uh. Yeah. I mean, if everything else fails, we can also look at the relocations, I guess, and do the bootstrap allocations in uncrafted assembler code or something like that. 
but but yes yeah. is... i mean uh, the issue is uh, even if it links today with, with build my gypsies i don't know if it, if it runs on the targets that require bootstrap allocation and that's i don't really know how to test that well and it might work today and it may not work tomorrow yeah <laughs> we, we need to really understand the state that we're passing around and and how to make sure we avoid the relocation issues. And, and I think if we design it around those two questions, we'll get to something that works and we and we can reason about it. But I also feel like we're in a fail safe mode here. Like honestly, if this blows up, we blow up in early bootstrap and it's gonna crash. And then the the week that we integrate this thing into a downstream. So I'll give an example. In Fedora, we do weekly syncs of uh, glibc development into Rawhide to keep it rolling forward. Like the second we see a tool chain change that brings this change in, it'll it'll blow up, or we'll notice it. So it, it to some degree, there's a fail-safe aspect of it. If we end up with relocations that are that are bad, I feel like we're going to see this if we break this. But that's just that's just my feeling because yeah. every time we've done something like this, we have seen it when it breaks right away. If if you actually do testing on all architectures that you need to test on, yeah. Well, we test I mean, on PPC sixty four LE. We test on x eighty six. We test on Z. We test on Air sixty four and thirty two bit ARM. We don't. Yeah. Uh, which which target? Alpha. Um, I actually have Alpha in my tester. So if you put it into the tree, uh, my tester will bootstrap GCC and build glibc and use it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I was just pointing out uh, hardware that uh, GGC still supports and that no one owns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alpha, HPPA, well, people still own HPPAs, but nobody cares. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. My, my point being is, is I have a tester that would give us a, a heads up on some of these esoteric targets. Um, and so if you know, when we get to that point where we want to move forward, we, we have ways of doing some deeper testing. I just want to make sure that when it's des you know, it's designed so that we we have confidence that it's correct, as opposed to it seems right. to work today, but we don't know where it's going to be in a month. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's probably what what should should improve uh, uh, with the with the loader, whatever you call it, uh, uh, that you do not need to test it on so many targets to have confidence that it works. So, so it's uh, okay. Okay, so the so there are some things you need for the bootstrap, right? But mm -hmm. you, uh, uh, but that's maybe a handful of thing, things, right? You mm -hmm. don't need tens of things like you have now. So, so if that is improved, then it's certainly a lot, a lot better testable, um, provable in general. Yeah. Um, HJ, I saw you wanted to make a comment there. I think yeah yeah i agree with uh, i have a back off here uh most people said here i think i re removed the uh, nested function supported should be put into a multiple smaller patches so instead of doing a one big one, that many things can go wrong, especially for those targets, they are not well tested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna, okay. So I've taken some notes there, and I actually think the avoid nested functions, avoid nested. I don't know why it doesn't show up in patchwork anymore. I have to figure out that later, why that patch that's linked there doesn't show up in patchwork, or at least I can't find it quickly. Um, Joseph did ask a question, and I want to get to Joseph's question, which was, uh, could we do bugzilla triage better, especially making sure bugs that have been fixed are closed? This seems like a similar backlog issue to patchwork view. So here's my answer to Joseph. It is absolutely a similar task to patch review doing uh, Bugzilla triage. But um, last cauldron, when we got together in this boff, I asked the general question, 
should we do bug triage or should we do patch review? And um, there was more support for driving a process of patch queue review because of the benefits it brought. Um, we should, we should absolutely try to mo do a uh, Bugzilla queue review. And I applaud Andrew Pinsky in GCC for the work that he does cleaning up the the, the GCC Bugzilla. Um, and it's simply time in from individual contributors. Um, Joseph, I think that the contributors do try to tag uh, a fix with a, with a bug number and then close that when it gets fixed, when we can do that. Um, I don't know how to make this process easier other than it costs resources. It just costs people's time to review the, the Bugzilla. And we, we do and could develop a community practice of doing some kind of weekly review where we go and we check what came in and we try to do a, a quick triage of what came in and we try to find people to help with that triage. So I, I do think it's a similar process to the queue review. Um, we just haven't started that process yet. So maybe does that answer your question? Uh, what we do in TCC is you uh, when you do a commit, uh, which uh, well well which met matters for some PR, you mentioned that in the commit message, uh, which uh, in the change log, as I had uh, before the change log, uh, and it then automatically ends up in Bugzilla. Uh, so, so so everyone uh, who cares about that that bug uh, will get the email about it, and then you can close it, and that usually works. Yeah, there is a similar pro process in TDC. The problem is the uh, the hook does not look at the uh, commit subject. So even if you put the bacteria number in the commit subject, it won't show up in the bacteria. Um, we broke the hook, I think is is what it is. Um, so the glibc commits and that hook need to get cleaned up. So, um, yeah, th that is a place where we, Seger, it is absolutely a place where we can, we have to do a little bit of community improvement in the infrastructure. We used to have the hook when we switched to the new ADA core hooks, we got the ADA core hooks improvement and, but then we busted the, um, the commit hooks getting s set up properly. Yeah. Yeah, the GCC ones were broken for a while as well. I think, uh, yeah, something changed in there at the, the ADA core hooks. Uh, it used to work, we tested it, and then it started to break. And now it no longer looks at the first line of the commit for some reason. I'm going to make put some stars beside this as something that I like we need to come back and fix because it it does make it harder to close bugs. If you see a bug and it's got a commit that was blatantly posted, then you can then someone can immediately have the attention to go and mark it closed as in the current release. So uh, I think I've got refocus on the patch queue for review is something that I can help drive. And the other one is switch fixing this this uh, the hooks within the GCC arena. I find I keep the bug open until I do all the, the back ports, which are usually a few weeks after the, the main main commit, rather than ch uh, making the closing the bug immediately. Uh, you know that way, you know when I port it back to GC seven and possibly GCC ten and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there could be a little uh, a little process gap there if someone wants the bug. Um, we have some keyword. We have some keyword tags that we do use to say, I want this bug in, in this branch, but we don't effectively use it. Mostly I would say, uh, Michael, because the downstream distributions backport actively to the release branches just based on their own needs. And so we often don't even have bugs associated with those. And we let the, we engage the downstream distros in helping us decide what needs to get backported to the release branches. And we actually, we, empower them to do the backports to the release branches. Uh, might suggest that you put a comment in the bug when you've got it upstream and you're expecting to move it downstream so that people who aren't as familiar with the process but are very interested in a particular bug will know that, oh, my fix is coming. 
Yeah, and I think that fixing the hooks should fix this because what should happen is um, the distro maintainer does the backport, posts it to libc stable, which is the discussion list for stable backports. Um, but as soon as they commit, my expectation is that the release branches are actively monitored by the hook, and therefore the bug should get an update saying this release branch got updated with the fix backport that you just had. So my feeling is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, if you think this doesn't work, but um, if we fix the ADA core hooks to report again for the release branches and for the active development branch, that when a distro maintainer does the backport to the release branch, and they, it will generate that bugzilla comment saying, fixed on release 234, fixed on release 233, so that you're getting the notifications if you're CC'd to that bug. Even if it's closed, you'll still get the emails. Certainly, automation is an excellent thing. Uh, I just was the the primary bug report before you're ready to close it, uh, when you've done the very first uh, commit at the upstream, mm -hmm. uh, is there a mechanism for making something happen or should we just remember to make our change in the bug report? Oh, you mean making it, wanting to make a change in the other, in the other downstreams? There is. No, no, no. Um, oh. When the upstream change commit happens, the reason I'm, mentioning this is I did uh, a fix for complex divide in GCC and I forgot to upstream up, update the bug report uh, a couple of months later I went back to look at the bug report because it occurred to me I hadn't put anything there and somebody else had said hey I'm gonna look at this when we already had a fix in place so they wasted some effort because I was slack in updating the bug the uh, the bug report at the very first commit mm-hmm and there was no automated uh, activity in GCC to say eh, a patch relating to this has been done. So as far as Seger's saying, I think though, the commit hooks for GCC should have posted a comment if the commit had had, an, it had, had a bug reference in it. I think that bug reference was missing because the complex divide was not really triggered or, or driven by that particular bug reference. The, mm. the bug reference was a very minor issue relative to what the, the commit dealt with. Uh, the GCC hooks uh, only do it if there's a bug reference in a specific place uh, uh, before the change log. And you mm -hmm. don't even have a change log in your commit message anymore in GDPC, right? We don't, but we look for bug numbers, bug XXX on the subject line. Cool. Oh, we used to. <laughs> Until it broke. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I do is, uh, if I see a bug that has been fixed, then I usually post, but do manually what a typical commit hook would do, like post the bug, uh, post the commit details to the bug, and then close the bug with. And Joseph pointed out we need to close the bugs uh, because of the newest file generation logic. So. Uh, actually fixed bugs have to be resolved fixed otherwise they don't get listed in the release notes so that yeah we would have to mark backport candidates in other ways i agree i think backport candidates are probably a separate discussion either a separate bug with the appropriate backport tags indicating which branches you want it on but like i said today i'm i th my the initial design of the process was to be as lightweight as possible, which is the bug gets done, it gets fixed. Once the bug is fixed on um, the development branch, it's you know it's going to come out in the next release. And if anybody wants it, then we are empowering them to engage on like libc stable mailing list and just do the backports because things that don't change ABI um, should be backportable to the release branches. And we should in go to if, sorry. Uh, we have fields in every bug that says uh, known to work, known to fail. Uh, so you at least know uh, 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 when a bug is filed already, right? Or when it has existed for a day or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you know what releases uh, uh, it applies to. So, so, so when a patch eventually shows up, you know whether you could uh, backport it and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Florian, did you want to raise another topic? Uh, I saw a question from Jeff on explicit loader invocations. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I could answer that. Yeah, please That'd go ahead. Awesome. Please do. <laughs> so we actually saw a lot of these. So uh, I fondly remember, I think it was a RAID 6 kernel bug, where you actually could uh, had a, a DS break area was like 128 megabytes away from from the stack bottom. Or yeah, or st uh, top of stack. So uh, depending on what the program does, uh, you could actually uh, consume so much heap that uh, once a deep recursion started, you crash because the stack can't be extended anymore. Mm -hmm. And this stuff happens all the time. Usually those are kernel bugs because the ASL ASLR is not set up correctly in the kernel. Yep. And yeah, th this is just. I think it's main, mainly a matter of of tuning the, uh, the the kernel ASLR default so that this doesn't really impact applications that much. And the layout changes. That's true. But um, I, in the future, I actually expect more use of the explicit loader invocation because. As you may have seen, we have added more options to the load or more capabilities. And in some ways, it's more predictable than using environment variables because um, what you do to the process doesn't automatically go uh, get applied to sub processes that process creates. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, it, it says like the, the, the position would be that um, the changes in memory layout really shouldn't impact things if you've got ASLR and, and you have enough space in your address space that, that you can keep things at a reasonable uh, location, which, which is a, that's a fair place to be. Um, I think part of what got us looking at this is, and, and I, I don't have the details on the specific piece of it, but we ran into a case where Erno was, we, we were trying to allocate, we couldn't allocate, Erno got set, we went to a different arena, got a valid allocation, but nobody ever cleared Erno. <laughs> um, and, and so people were surprised by that. And that's what got us looking at it. Um, but if the if the position is, uh, if you're going to run something via LD.SO, you should expect a degree of uh, change in your memory layout and you have to deal with it. And that that's that's a reasonable expectation, I think. Yeah, uh, obviously the kernel should lay out things so that you have a sufficiently large, large stack and S break. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and then maybe it would have gone, what went wrong for us, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there are two cases you need to deal with actually, that's the uh, uh, randomized address space turned on and the other setting is a randomized up, uh, address space turned off. And the tricky part is, I mean, we have builders that disable randomization for increased reproducibility that kind of tends to trigger different kinds of bugs. And of course, if you run stuff on the GDB, you also get uh, randomization disabled by default. And the kernel has been known to generate fairly bad layouts with randomization disabled. On some yeah, and I think course. we we might be running with randomization disabled by default. We, yeah. we know it works. <laughs> and so we turned it off just to, to make the reproducibility problem easier to tackle right now. So that it, that may be related. So I'll, I'll, I'll check into that. That is a, a good piece of insight. Yeah, and then there's the, the issue of performance differences. Uh, yep. <laughs> and your hardware has certain cache behavior or something like that. <laughs> yep. <that's, laughs> Yeah, but I expect more users of LDSO, and I actually want to install it into user bin eventually. Okay. So this is really something that should work out of the box in a reasonable way. Thank you, Florian. Um, okay, so that answered Jeff's question, and I took a note on changes in memory layout should not impact things due to ASLR. Yeah, I mean, we have seen bugs where if the kernel invokes LDSO first, then it, it does some layouts that don't work because there's like not enough memory. But 
those shouldn't happen in modern kernels. Um, I'm trying to make a go through here. Wei Wu was talking about issues with resolve map. Um, Joseph again talking about fixed and white spaces and what to what to trigger bug updates on. And I think that's just related again back to our Ada core um, Ada core packages. Um, for, and for those of you that that don't know, yeah, we have um, CI/CD running uh, in Patchwork for glibc, running a patch application bot, tribot and i386 regression tribot, which does catch stuff. Um, and I think we can improve that. And I'm going to be adding to the uh, tribots that run, so we get some more coverage. Uh, any any other questions from? the audience or developers let me see if there's anything else florian anything you want to raise i see your mic yeah if no one else has anything uh, uh what about the main list and the from rewriting can we get rid of that um this is one of the most annoying issues i guess that i deal with <laughs> Um, the from rewriting is annoying because patchwork then sometimes mangles the it from and drops the patches out of people's queues in the patchwork patch tracking. Um, yeah, and Git AM also doesn't work, and that's also very annoying. Yeah, yeah I I put in a commit hook that this allows pushing these patches to to the repository, but so this is yeah. a it's a good question. I don't have an answer. So I assist as a volunteer with overseers for issues um, related to, to mailing lists and, and other parts. So I mean, uh, sourceware.org, um, we should be able to do this. So I think what, have, like, did we write up a formal request to overseers to say, can we look into this? Is this something we can fix? I, I don't know the status of that. So. Um, if I'd say anything, it's a formal request for a change in configuration via overseers. Um, Mark, is Mark, Mark the, the issue there is that is we would have to stop store stripping HTML attachments also to the mailing list. Yes, the, the rule is don't change anything. And if you don't change it, if you don't change anything, then uh, then you don't need to worry about deacon breaking and so on, and you don't need to rewrite um, from headers at all. Um, Constantin Rabbit said has done using MLMMJ with the kernel list, uh, in which he talks about this. Um, it's worth looking at if you haven't already. Yeah, um, if I'm being honest, I think we shouldn't be changing anything. And in this modern day and age, we'll have to find a way to deal with mail to the list and avoid the from rewriting, which I also dislike. Yeah, yeah the, so. The obvious alternative to stripping HTML is simply refusing emails that uh, they have HTML in it. Yep. But that's not really friendly to new contributors. Yes. Well, well, that well, is also troublesome because either you drop the email completely, and then people uh, and then people end up oblivious to the fact, uh, to the fact that you've uh, re you've rejected it. Um, or you send back an SMTP rejection code, which often gets ignored, or you bounce it, in which case you're suddenly you're suddenly a source of spray, and you should never do that. So there are no good answers here. Well, no, I think the good answer is we just start allowing all email, and we, um, and that's it because it's an open mailing list, and people should be able to post in ways that they want. So not passing judgment on exactly how people are going to send email to our list, but passing technical judgment on what we expect from the quality of their contributions. Exactly. If people can't can't sanitize HTML email into something they can read, why, I did think they should, they should probably shouldn't be on any technical mailing list or any mailing list at all in the modern world. <laughs> the only open question that would remain there is like, does this mean we get a bunch of spam to the list? Um, and I think that simply has to get handled by a spam filter. Uh, 
Um, so Florian, do we have a way forward then? I, I think is is it a request to change nothing and allow HTML email to overseers? Yeah, I mean the the goal is to be able to stay compatible with DKIM and not to do formal writing, I guess. Yeah, it is. And I think. Uh, also, don't wrap. I, I saw some some analysis to like wrapping the original message message as an attachment. And yeah, I think it it boils down that we transition from one self supported mailing list manager to another self supported mailing list manager. Um, in the sense that the upstream is basically un, uh, dormant, and maybe our mailman version that comes from CentOS 8 doesn't have all the uh, new features uh, patched into it. We we don't know that yet, right? So that would be mm -hmm. supposition. In this case, what we really have to do is stop the rewriting and allow HTML mail, and then if that lets us move forward, then we can move forward with that, as long as we can keep delivering that and accepting it. Uh, yeah, Mark, I was going to ask, I see Mark is here, but uh, Mark, because I know you have some experience with this and we've talked about this before. Do you have any feedback that you want to give, Mark? Um, no, not really, except for this. Uh, I'm not the person doing the mailing list. and. Uh, you, you you really have to get buy-in from Frank and uh, uh, Christoph. Okay. I see there's a question, can B4 be used for glibc patches posted on libc alpha? If you can point B4 to public inbox.org, I think you should be able to use it because Lipsy Alpha is on public inbox.org. And I hope that answers the question. I also like B4 more than Patchwork because Patchwork requires an access token even for read only access. So if I have a lab machine that I don't trust fully, and want to apply a patch there that I can't use Patchwork? Uh, you can. We just make an account for the lab machine and we give it its access token and the lab machine gets a restricted account rather than your privileged account that allows you to edit everything because you're a senior maintainer. Would that work? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's kind of pointless, right? I mean, the data should we be read-only and if available without authentication, I mean. I, I don't disagree with you. I, I don't disagree. But the way that systems get built is that it requires that access token. So we can submit something upstream and say, it, would there be a way? Like, I mean, it, we are, I, I was just talking yesterday to the, some of the patchwork maintainers because I raised some patchwork issues on Twitter um, surrounding conversations here. Um, and and yeah, and they, they are open and they're curious what our use cases are and they're curious where we've got problems. So I think the patchwork maintainers are open to us filing a request and saying, hey, could we get something without an access token for read only list access? So I don't think it's a don't think it's a dead end. Maybe it's also just a peculiar configuration on our end. Yeah, I haven't tried, but I believe that just about every patchwork client starts off with needing an access token in order to get access to the APIs and you protect yourself potentially from like unauthenticated access. Uh, I, like it would only be DDoS protection you would have, right? If someone had unauthenticated access. So yeah, I don't know what mm -hmm. happens there. So I hope we answer the question. Can you use before with Lipsy Alpha? Yes, if you can point uh, before at Libsy Alpha on uh, public inbox. I believe, Florian, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like the non-official upstream public inbox is archiving Libsy Alpha, so you can point it at that list. I, and I, I thought it was there, but I'm not sure really. But... It is, it is. I even looked at it yesterday. Uh, I'll see if I can dump it into the chat. It's not lorekernel.org. It's the other public inbox archive. I think it's unofficial mirror of libc alpha and public inbox.org. Yeah, you got it. Oh. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You beat me to the paste. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like, uh, and also public inbox is spectacular for the speed of the search, the speed of the static page displays and going through Libsy off on public inbox is really, really, really nice. I think it's another infrastructure piece we, we could talk about, but, um, so we're, we're two minutes past the time for the boff and I want to give, I want to be conscious of people's time. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll say it's like, why didn't I know about that? Um, yeah, I want to be conscious of people's time um, and thank everybody for coming and asking their questions. I think we got through a handful of questions, which were, are we ready for the PPC64 LE long double change in downstream? I think the answer is yes, except a bug. I said patch review retrospective on 10 months of patch queue review was refocus on the queue for review. Um, I think that should help. The next question, which is, Feng Ri Song was saying, will glibc be happy with Clang buildability? The answer has been yes. Uh, Joseph's suggestion is patches should be split into logical changes. Feng Ri, I almost got to responding to your email. I'll respond to your email after this. And I think we request that um, the patch that we have for 27220 be split into a smaller series of patches to make them easier to review. And we need to solve this answer about bootstrap relocations. Um, Joseph asked, could we do better in Bugzilla triage? And the answer is uh, yes, but I think we can do it by starting by fixing the broken hooks to make it easier to close bugs. Uh, and uh, and from there, begin a more organized, maybe weekly process of bug review. Jeff asked about explicit loader invocations and results in different memory layout. And we said, yeah, you're going to get different memory layout because the kernel is going to load LDSO first, and then it's going to map things in. But hopefully with ASLR, it works. Uh, and Florian asked about mailing list and from rewriting, which is problematic with both Git AM and patchwork. And I think the action item there is to, as Mark says, talk to Frank and uh, Christopher Failer and see if we can get buy in about no rewriting, uh, all HTML allowed. Um, and that's it. Thanks everybody for attending the, the GLibC boff. Um, see you guys throughout the, the rest of the week. And someone tell me if I'm wrong. We're supposed to end at 1.45, I believe, and there's no one after this. That's correct. Um, so we are wrapping up uh, okay. after, your, after this session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, for hosting. And um, thank you, everyone, for your participation.